Um, so they're very easy to prepare. It, it's, it's You're doing what you would do naturally probably during office hours or lecture. You're, you're talking and at the same time you're writing and you're recording it. Um, you don't have to be worried about doing it professional. These aren't professional at all. I mean, it's, it's a nice aspect of them. They should be very quick to make. And they have a long lasting impact. Once you have them online, once they're there, there's no reason to take them off unless you're going to improve upon them or, or do something else to them in the future. Um, so students, you know, five, ten years from now should be able to watch the same video that they saw off today. Well, well, I'm looking at this at, at iTunes U. It's, it's great. So the interesting thing would be whether there's a social net, you know, sort of commenting back on it. Component. Yeah, the, the one thing with iTunes U right now is that they could they could give it, you know, one to five stars. Right. That It's nice. We can see what videos are popular, but it doesn't tell us necessarily Feedback on a specific video. Totally great. But yeah, it's, yeah. Since iTunes U came on, it does. I think the best aspect of it is to subscribe. Any new videos that we put up there, students automatically get it and see it. So if you started a course, you could subscribe to that course because you have it organized with respect to various topics. Right. In one, it looks like almost one. There are a lot. Of, there are a lot of these. Sure. Yeah. Actually, uh, I think that's. I could. I could just. Give the heads of what we have. So, as I mentioned, we have about 230 of these. Uh, in the thermodynamics class, we're up to about 86, 70 for kinetics and reactive design, 60 for the sophomore level course in material energy balances. And then the other three courses on the right are the ones that we're going to start working on. Our goal is to have about 75 to 80 of these each our eventual goal. Obviously, as we start filling in uh, spots, we can see what we're missing and whether we've reached our goal now because I want to fill those spots in. Um, so far, we, we've solicited and we may make it semi-obvious online that people are welcome to contribute. You know, we're looking for more people to add to these. And we haven't, since we've had this up in the last eight months, gotten into those. But we have received comments from students at other universities. Uh, one of our favorites so far is <coughs> from an unnamed university in Texas that basically said, you know, I love your screencasts, you're very helpful. My teacher's really, really bad at teaching this class. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we got a, a little bit of a kick out of it, and the fact that it was reaching out to the student had, you know, the time to email us and say that they, they were good for them. But, yeah. How, how are you filtering out, like, if you had a teacher who, say, wasn't necessarily easy to understand or wasn't as exciting as another teacher, how do you decide which one to include in, say, a particular screencast about thermodynamics or whatever? Uh, so far, right now, we're just trying to get content up there. Uh, when we get to the point that we have too much content, we can start making those decisions. We might, but right now, it's just we just want it online. Whether the teacher's super excited to listen to or not, it's there, it's helpful. So maybe, maybe you're asking, there's only two people that made those some dynamics ones. We haven't okay. gotten them from somewhere else and put them on. All right. Thank you. Well, yeah, I guess I'm thinking the same thing. Over time, um, if this proves to be useful, every faculty member at every institution in the country doesn't need to or want to make these things. So there needs to be some mechanism to, to think about how, how would you select from all the thermo um, screencasts that have been created across the country, which ones you'd like to show your, you'd like to make available to your students, because you don't want them to have to just, you know, try to do the filtering. Kind of like um, yeah, I'm wondering what's going to be the mechanism. And with textbooks, there's only a dozen, and over time you, you learn those textbooks, but here it's, it's potentially an overwhelming filtering problem. I'm issue, wondering what's going to be the mechanism to well, evaluate we or characterize screencasts. Well, why would you want to evaluate them? I mean, you're going to, I mean, isn't that, you're not arguing that textbooks are really a great learning resource, are you? They can be. They, they, they could can be. be. But they sure in, can be. But in many places. And so could these things, and a bad one, maybe less so. So, so you know, you would like to have, I, I guess it would be worth thinking about. This could be a discipline. How do you characterize the efficacy? The, the, yeah, but this could be a disciplinary, different kind of context, right? Because physics may be different because there's lots of problems in textbooks. And, you know, and, and it's very much more difficult to do problems in cell and molecular biology in the same way it is to do problems in physics, I believe. Right? And so, I mean, I'm really, I, you're going to talk about the authoring tool for this because I could actually see everybody just putting their notes up on the fly, basically, and having it sitting there. And 
there'd be a selection for what's the good ones. Sure. Yeah, I mean, like I said, that would, that would be a great problem. It would be neat to be able to aggregate ones, you know, from other, you know, to link them from other sources into, you know, if you found a good one and you wanted to replace yours, you say, well, you know, this one's way better than the one I did. You know, sure. Just, and I want to, I want to make sort of a, a tree structure. I think, that you're, I think you're thinking a little too narrowly. Like, if you're going to have eventually, you have all these different teachers that are teaching the same thing, right? And you're going to have all these different videos to choose from. Just which one's better is something that I think is better defined for individual students. Like whether a student no, identifies with you know a particular nationality or something, would prefer to learn from somebody who's the same color as them or speaks the same language. Well, obviously, a long ways down the line, but you know, I mean, you, you take this really a, deep. It's a different. It's probably it's a problem that doesn't exist because I don't think there are so many chemical engineering faculty are going to take the time and they look and say, oh, you already made them for me. Why would I spend the time right. making them? I'll use yours. And in, that, in some ways that's what we hope, you know, would have a broader impact to other people who would use it. So we don't see that maybe because chemical engineering is a small enough field, so now you filter out the 90% of the people that aren't going to do any teaching besides, you know, get up and lecture. So there's a small number of people that even would be doing that. I think physics and biology are much bigger. But I mean, you, you had 10 different teachers who were willing to do something for that. I mean, God, that'd be great. And we we talked to them, but it. so far it hasn't, you know. Yeah, hopefully you know, when I talk on some of the other stuff later on, you know, we'll have that issue. But right now it's just... And there'd yeah, be no problem having some other site. Someone has a bunch of videos that nothing yeah. hurts. Sweet. Thank you. Um, so if you were interested in making these, you mentioned about the software earlier, um, basic, your basic ingredients involve three things. One, you would need some kind of input device, likely a, a, a tablet PC. You could also use a smart board. Uh, if there's a you know, department smart board, we got one last year, so that students can go in there and use that, which is kind of nice. If, you, if you're not familiar with the smart board, it's basically a whiteboard that you can write on and it can record everything you're writing. So, do, you, do you have to know if the iPad would allow this? So, the iPad doesn't yet that we know of have the capabilities to, to do this, but I guarantee you probably within three months it will. I shouldn't say I guarantee you, but it's, it's, it's pretty close. I mean, I don't see, as long as you had a headset, which was the other thing that you would need. Um, the reason we recommend a headset is if you use any kind of computer mics, you just get too much background noise, you can't maintain a good tone when you're speaking, it just, it's not as, as good. And it, from a student's perspective, if you're listening to a video, it's just really hard to understand. Pause, turn off, shut down, you know, yeah. and don't bother listening. So that's that's a big part of the screencast is the narration from the instructor. So I recommend a headset. Um, going back to the tablet really quick, there's three software things that we use. Um, PowerPoint, kind of obvious one if you're going to need a lot of images that you already needed to create to put in there, plots, graphs, stuff like that. It's nice to go slide to slide through, through that little recording. However, it also could be very tedious the way that the software we use records the PowerPoint. So we might use OneNote or Journal, which are basically digital notebooks. Um, so the nice thing about Journal is it's just white page you can write on it, scroll down, um, so you can have everything on the page that you're writing. Same thing with OneNote; they pretty much work work the same. But those are the programs that we use. Um, Camtasia is the software we use. It, the nice thing about Camtasia, although you have to pay for it is that it's a screen capture program that allows you to do a pretty decent video editing. Um, so we only need one program to do both. There's, there's freeware out there, Jing, J-I-N-G, is made by the same company, TechSmith, and it's freeware, it just does recording, so there's no editing, which Don't might be have fine. Don't site license for Camtasia? I'm sorry? Don't we have a site license for Camtasia? Well, plus they have a free uh, version. Well, it's not a site license, more of a client number. Computers. Yeah, the university, though, when we were piloting Camtasia two years ago, had a license. Maybe they were so far as changed it. Um, anyway, so we should look into this. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the one we would recommend. We, I haven't looked into too many others, but research on discussion forums and blogs about this kind of software suggests that this is one of the better ones you can have. Adobe also makes a program I think called Captivate, um, but it's a little bit more expensive, a little bit more technical. Um, nice thing about this. Have a tablet, though. Sorry to keep it. Yeah, no, no. You no, have to have a tablet to do that. I mean, you can screen capture a PowerPoint presentation on an old school PC. You can. You lose. You lose your ability to write um, while you're going through it. 
then it becomes something that's a little bit different from what we've been making. But you could you could just record your your presentation going through some notes or something like that. Um, yeah, or for or for free. A tutorial using software, you don't need a tablet. Right, or you could or for FET. So with a computer sims that we do, you can have interactive right. anything right. that has an input. Yeah, well, absolutely. there are a lot of free drawing apps on I see on the iPad. So the question is syncing. In a way, yeah, yeah finding the software that allows you to record to it, sync you know. it, right? Because this won't, I don't think they'll ever put it so it has, knowing the way Apple thinks about design, I don't think they'll put two prod holes in it because they, they have one for a headphone because that's got a built in microphone or whatever for Skype. So I don't know whether they, they have Bluetooth built in, they do have Bluetooth, so, so you can use it. But, so, I mean, that's pretty much all you need, and yeah, as you mentioned, you don't even really need a tablet, depending on the goal or what you're looking for. But definitely suggest trying out Camtasia. And someone, I think you mentioned that there is a, you could download them and have it free for, I think, 30 or 60 days. I've had a couple of different free versions of Camtasia on a couple of different computers. You, you just got to look around on there for the one that isn't a trial and isn't pay. Right. But. Very easy to use. You click a button and you can save your dimensions of the screen you want to record and it just records it and you hit stop and you can hit produce. It gives you a number of options. You can produce for YouTube or an MP4 file or whatever. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But, so the, the, as we've gone through this and made all these videos, we started very just like let's record you know, something and put it online. So it's a more systematic approach. Um, really what we've, we've noticed is that it's really helpful for students if as soon as they watch the video they know exactly what it's about. So mentioning briefly the objective of the video, what they're going to see, what it's about, whether it's an example problem on a certain thing or uh, an overview of a topic um, so that they can get a clear description of that. And hopefully that matches some kind of specific learning objective that you have in class. Otherwise, you know, why are you spending your time making it, per se? Um, as I mentioned and harped on a number of times, keep it short. Um, recommend clearing your environment. And what I mean by that is removing any pulling your phone off, shutting the door, because as you're recording, if you have these interruptions, it gets recorded in an interruption, and unless you stop and pause it and restart kind of thing, that becomes something that can deter the work you put into it. So, could you elaborate on short? Short, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so 15 seconds is going to be too short. Short, yeah, I mean, the shortest video we might have is like three and a half, four minutes. Okay. Um, that's just over the course of making all the videos, it's just the shortest, it might have been like a very brief, Here's a very thing that a lot of people are making. Here's a very specific topic where a lot of students are making a mistake on. We just reiterate one other way. Um, some of the longer ones, we've, we've hit 15 minutes. And we, when we get over 10 minutes, now we're trying to make them into two parts. Again, because students just are more likely to watch it if it's less than 10 minutes. Uh, speak naturally. So as you're recording this, just speak how you normally would. It's very easy for someone, whether it's you or someone else you hire, to go through and edit all the videos to just remove dead time, to remove ums and ahs, sneezes, coughs, you know, whatever. So just speak how you normally speak, because that's you know that's how students kind of can, can connect with you anyway. Otherwise, it seems very systematic and robotic. So it's better that you just speak naturally and go with the flow. Helpful if you follow a problem-solving outline, especially if you want your students to kind of get into that habit of practice when they're approaching the problem. So maybe, you know, if you keep harping that the students should start with the diagram, then in the videos when you go over these problems, you should start with the diagram. Um, we have a problem solving outline that we kind of suggest for chemical engineering problems that we put online for both students and faculty to look at. Um, by no means is it the outline or anything, but it's just something we can suggest. So we try to follow that as we go through reporters. Um, nice thing about Camtasia is you can pause while you're recording. So if you get to a part where you're just, you're, lost your, your flow, you need some time, you need to take a break, you need to come back. It's better to pause, otherwise if you just keep recording dead space, the file size is really large. <laughs> nice thing too with pausing is say you make you know, a five minute recording that goes well, pause it, take a second, and then all of a sudden, you know, two minutes in, you make a couple mistakes, you notice it. You don't have to get rid of your whole video. You can, your first part's fine, you can either delete the second part and make the second video, or just keep going and remove all that later. So, um, keep it simple. The highlight, annotate, it's nice that afterwards you could go in and maybe if you're talking about a certain equation and it's hard for the student to tell because there's four equations on there, you can put up a highlighting bar around that equation. Um, you can draw arrows uh, after the fact if you want to grab their attention. Uh, you can pull up a call-out bubble, so maybe you might say this is in the back of your book, 
well, students in this class might know what that means, but students in you know, China might not know what that means, so you pull a call out that says, referring to textbook, blah, blah, blah. Or, please see this other screencast on this topic for more information. So you can add that in later, just as more references for the student to use, which definitely does become helpful. Um, so the last thing is, once we have these videos, the way we're putting on online, as I mentioned, iTunes, you already, uh, one of the more ubiquitous formats is the MP4 file. As, as I said, Camtasia can do a number of things, and you can produce a number of things at once. But the MP4 file works on a number of portable devices, smartphones, tablets, etc. Um, quick time players play it. So it's just it's just the easiest format to work with. Uh, both YouTube and Vimeo accepts MP4 files. We've been using Vimeo because as you heard me bad talk YouTube earlier, it's, uh, it's more geared towards artistic efforts, educational videos. So there's a lot of the random nonsense that's on YouTube that's not there on Vimeo. Um, so that's why we decided to put them on Vimeo, but also Vimeo makes it a little bit easier to upload them from the desktop, uh, categorize them in channels, and we just feel pretty comfortable to go on with them. So it's pretty helpful. We take all our videos that are uploaded to Vimeo, and we went through a social network called Ning, which is kind of like a group Facebook without the Facebook yet aspect to it. It's, it's, uh, it's more for groups focused on certain things, I guess. Yeah, maybe it'd be like a group aspect of Facebook. But um, they allow you to design your own website. So you can change all the coding to make it look like however you want. So they just play host. Uh, they give you a couple templates. But it was the easiest way for us to start. It was recommended by some people on campus. And so we got our site there. It's www.learnchemie.com. Um, basically, when you go to that page, this is what you would see. As I mentioned, the project has to do with both concept tests and screencasts. Anybody could access the screencasts. You just go to the tab, and it will pull down the list of classes. Uh, so say you wanted to look up a topic on a class for thermodynamics, then you would have a table of contents for that class on thermodynamics. All the videos we have there, listed out there, written by topic. Um, one thing that's not shown here, because I didn't take the clipping correctly, right above this, we have all the videos organized to the more popular textbooks that are used for these classes. And we've contacted uh, Wiley and, and companies that distribute the textbooks to just see like, the number of institutions that are carrying them to get an idea of how popular they were. So we felt pretty com comfortable with the couple that we put on here and we've organized two uh, and find more helpful. As I mentioned, the nice thing about organizing these to textbook is, is twofold. One, students like it uh, so far that we've seen from comments. As they are following through the class, they, they know that, you know, I don't need to look at this video per se because it's later, but these videos are here. Maybe my teacher didn't say something about them, you know, and I can just watch them. Um, so, you know, another good aspect about these is you don't even have to assign them, students are watching them. You, know, you have to assign them. And so it shows that the students, again, are really like these. But the second fold about the textbook is it also allows us making them figure out what the apps are so that in the future we can try to fill those. So I was just trying to play. Um one of the ones from iTunes U on this guy and it says it can't, it can't play it. Is that is that a um, bug or a feature of this? <laughs> what are you using? Uh, it's just at iTouch. Do you know if there's... You can't play a video on iTunes. It, it, so the iTunes videos just say they can't play on this device. Huh. Well, I've been playing. Yeah. I just tried a couple. Yeah, what, so what's the... These are MP4s on iTunes? They're MP4s on you iTunes. You can iTunes. play it from that website, yeah, okay. yeah, you might be able... Yeah, if you go... If you open up a browser and... and Phone, you should be able to play it from that site. Otherwise, you have to pick apart your, your device. But, um, that sounds cool. The I know the videos play through iTunes on, on a laptop. They sure do play on and here and on the iPad. So thank you for verifying that. I'm watching it. So when you pick a video, we have them. Not listening to you anymore. You're like, no, that's, that's fine. Hey, good. We got you interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a description of the video, and then the student could just play this within it. Um, the nice thing here is we could we could collect information on, on how it's played through here using Google Analytics, so we could kind of track the usage. But regardless, they have the option to play through this site, or they could go straight to Vimeo. Uh, Vimeo has its own player, has buttons to allow them to share them through emails or embed. One of the really interesting things we saw, um, not being a big social media fan myself, but We've seen that a number of people have actually gone to the videos via link from Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so students are sharing them on their Facebook pages for their classmates. So it's starting to spread, which is nice. Um, the other nice thing about Vimeo is you could organize them by channels and have all the, the videos that we put on chronologically. So students are watching one video and then saying, okay, maybe I'll watch this too. So it makes it
Does Vimeo have a con uh, comment section? Vimeo does have a comment section. The one downside with that is you have to become a member, but it's free. So it's a quick sign up and then you can post your own videos just like YouTube, but then you can comment. I think YouTube's the same way. I think you can't comment on a video unless you sign up with YouTube. So it's just, so far, we've had a couple of students like a video. That's just an aspect of Vimeo that, that's there. But we've had no comments like, hey, can you do something like this too? Which we would love to see. I'm waiting for it. Yeah. But, um, so. Well, there's a $2 app here called Animation Creator that everybody likes. Um, for two bucks. Let's see. So, just to summarize everything, uh, as I've harped on here, students obviously like them. They've watched them over 18,000 times in the last eight months, and we're hoping to break 20,000 by the end of the next month, and maybe 25,000 by the end of the semester. And as we keep putting more videos on there, hopefully that will just keep exponentially growing. Um, very inexpensive once you get the software to make, just your time, but it's really easy and short to make them and put them online. And like I said, once they're there, uh, it has a long lasting impact. Um, hopefully, if you're trying to do your classes more towards active learning styles, you know, kind of providing these, these as resources for the students that might help you do that. Um, big aspect again that students could use these at their own pace. They maybe they're too shy to be in class, so they could watch these first, and that might help them just as much. Um, but the, the, one of the really nice things is that it has a really wide applicability. I mean, these could be geared for a freshman class or a graduate class. Uh, maybe graduate students trying to remember a topic from their undergrad could go back and watch these. Um, so far, we've noticed that they've been played throughout the world and in every state except Alaska and in 103 countries. So uh, it's 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 growing in use, um, which, is, which is really nice as well. So I guess with that, you, you you keep commenting that these things are easy to make. Yeah. Um, have you actually quantified how long it takes to prepare? make a five-minute video? Uh, I mean, I'm assuming it's, it's more than just it's something they do anyway. They have, they have yeah. to prepare for it, prepare the... It just depends on, on the person. Like, I mean, us, us three make it, right? Maybe Audrey and me, we're, we're trying to make a topic that we learned eight years ago, so we got to go back to the book, we got to relay the topic or refresh ourselves on something, mm -hmm. pick a specific problem, you know, maybe modify it a little bit and then make the problem. So for a five-minute video, it might take us half hour to an hour. Because John's making a thermodynamics video and that's his thing. He could just hit play, start writing down a topic, have a five minute video in five minutes, and we're done with it. It's, well, it's gotta be more than five minutes. That, that, that's, that's what I'm wondering at. It. It's more than five ten, minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. It, really, it really is that quick. Yeah, I mean, I have a computer set up at home to just do this, so I don't have to open any software, everything mm -hmm. just ready to go, and, you know, as long as I have what I want to do, yeah, then it's less than ten minutes. So I've called some example problems we've used before. It would be great if you guys would run a workshop at some point. So how about a screencast about building screencasts? Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, actually, on the, the, our homepage, the learnkimmy.com, there is a screencast. Um, there's three parts. One on what screencasts are, which I kind of showed you already. Two on, on uh, kind of how to use them as a student, how you should kind of approach them. We suggest, from a, you know, as a student's perspective, you might not necessarily want to just hit play and run through it, right. you know, especially since a lot of, a good vast majority of them are all worked out problems. You know, we set up the solution, we set up the problem, read out the problem to them, and then you know, suggest pausing at this point, maybe set up the solution a little bit, set up your approach. So implementation suggestions for Right. Exactly. So we have that online too, we've got video, and I forgot the third part, I think it was just how to use the site. Right. So you don't have um, such a thing for faculty? Would be in terms nice of like how to make a video? Yeah, 10 minutes. Uh, like we, we don't. Screencast actually. on how to make a screencast. Screencast on making a screencast? Yeah. yeah. Here's what you need. They do it. Sure. Yeah. Set it up. It's yeah. kind of like a never ending tunnel. It would be like a <laughs> recording of your computer recording. Yeah, you need something to record using Camtasia to record. Right. So. We have to set up a line of people yeah. around the room. Uh, so, so in particular, that implies that you you haven't there isn't a mechanism to like add a it, it's not about taking a video it has to be something that's like a, a screen capture off of the computer. I mean that's the software we use is specifically especially since we're using tablets we are writing and having to capture what we're writing. 
Um, so it's not like we're using a, a video camcorder per se, recording something like in class or a demonstration to put down. You could, as I mentioned, the flipped classroom guys up at UNC, a lot of the stuff they do for their high school chemistry classes, they might record something they're doing on their desktop, put their video inset talking about it, and then write on the screen in Camtasia through editing software. So then that becomes something that the students are actually seeing them actively do, rather than writing on a tablet. So you could I think our motivation was to minimize the time. And part of it was originally to replace, you know, start using concept tests in class, and students say, well, you're not doing any example problems. I'm not trying to explain you that's true, but, you know, here's the reasons. But still, they would always ask. So it's like, oh, I'll just do some example problems and put them online. Now they don't ask that anymore. And, and we don't assign them, so the fact they watch them is strictly voluntary. So I should, maybe off offline, I should tell you. So 10 years ago, I, um, I worked with a company called ThinkWell, um, which which produced, they, they were creating what they were thinking of as um, video textbooks. Mm -hmm. But it, it was almost exactly this. So I created 120 10-minute videos. And uh, it was done in a professional studio, so it wasn't, you know, free. And maybe that's, maybe that's been the fundamental problem, is that the students had to buy this. Um, there, was a, there was a team of, you know, animators. Uh, so these things were done extremely professionally in the end. You know, I, I, I'm writing, of course, it wasn't on a tablet, but there was a, a, a camera up above that was recording my writing, um, and then they would they would um, have uh, equations off on the side, and and these things were sold. Many many faculty at Colorado have looked at this and said not interested, and I, I'm I'm sort of curious to talk about like why, w w when will faculty um, want to use this, maybe that you figured out a way to get around it, which is it's just available and it's free, so the students use it and find it anyway. I have a question. So when you did this with two years ago, and were students as connected, like little devices? Not remotely. Um, it's still in existence. Um, you know, this little company has always been struggling. Uh, they're, they're just barely, you know, they're just barely keeping above water. Um, it never, it never caught on, and they've done this in every discipline, so there's there's like between 120 and 250 10 minute videos in chemistry, physics, and it's like 20 or 30 different uh, topical areas where these things exist. But people have to pay for it, so maybe, maybe that's the big difference. Well, I mean, there's, that's part of the trick, right? Now you're competing with MIT, right? So the, there's, the, there's the illusion in any case that it's all free, it's all available free. We want to correct you real quick, we're not competing. No, 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 but I'm just, you're competing for people's attention, right? So you're always competing for people's attention. So, well, it is a different goal, and this is, I mean, I love this. I think this is like the, the coolest possible thing. Um, and, you know, if you're assigning it to your students, it's like fantastic, right? You know, here's what I want you to look at, take a look, I've done it. I'm grading the final. You don't have to worry about whether it's right or not, because I'm grading the final. If you say what I said, it's right. You know, so, I mean, so you don't have all that editing, you know, that kind of, so the question is whether people are going to start, you, you know, you're going to get, you get, people are going to integrate it so that people come to class ready to talk about things. Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what their movement is for the most part. And they're actually looking into it, it's called the Flip Classroom Network, but they're having a workshop in Denver, I think, in July, and they're trying to get a bunch of people to talk about how to do that. But this, see, the, the nice thing about this, to me, is it's very low barrier to entry. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Particularly if we can put our materials for our courses through the CU iTunes U website. So, you know, materials for one course are all in one folder. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing. And that's what they're doing here, right? So, so you know, that makes it a lot easier. And then a lot easier to share if you want. I mean, I like the idea of linking them together if at some point you like this or that or whatever. But, well, but I don't care about, you know, I don't really care about that. Except, you know, now you say, okay, here's the stuff for my, you know, Ancillary stuff for this class. Right. Yeah, it's there, it's there for that aspect. You could absolutely. I mean, and, and John's used that in the past of saying, hey, I suggest that these videos you know, are there, they help you. Um, but as you mentioned, none of them in the past have been assigned. We don't know if they're being assigned in other institutions or not at this point. Um, you know, okay. I, think, I think out of the 18,000 videos, about 9,000 since, like, so I'm just making a number now, but I, about roughly two thirds of them. Are played in the U.S. 
and over half of them have been played outside the state of Colorado. So it's it was definitely very predominantly um, Colorado at first. You know, as we do about them, and once we were trying to get the word out. Lately, about 50% of the people coming to the site to watch the videos have found it through Google, typing in topics and stuff like that. So it's really promising that it's, it's becoming more. Oh, did so Google a searches iTunes U? No, if they Google search like momentum flux, it might bring them to our page. Oh, okay. So that bring you to, that's bringing you to your web page, not the right. iTunes. Stuff. Right. Do okay. uh, you have any interest at all in having like? Example questions then that a student would do either before the video or after, so you could get like direct feedback on the impact of video on a student, and they would have an ability to practice what they just learned and get feedback on their practice. Or? Make it more interactive, like the Illinois Free Flights. Yeah, maybe we've, we've seen those. Illinois yeah. has created a set. They call them I forget what Free Flights or something. Free flights. And um, so Mike Dudson has been actually assigning these. Um, they're little 10 or 15 minute, and it's a mix of this, and I think there is some video of the of the faculty members. So it's sort of a so little flash video, right? And and uh, it has it has um, concept tests built into it. So in order to proceed, the students answer questions and then and then continue along, and Mike gets some feedback about how much time they spent and and what their answers were to those intermediate questions. So that's, that's one nice thing about Camtasia is it actually has a built-in quiz option that you can do that. So you can make a quiz question in the video and have it so the student can't progress unless they answer it correctly or they can progress regardless of the answer. Um, it has to be a flash file though. So that was one aspect is that when we started doing this, uh, I'm no programmer and so the website basically wouldn't accept flash files. Um, so that's why we, dead. we didn't even go that route. But yeah, to make it an interactive video, they have to be flash. <laughs> Could you talk about how the, the, the mind no, how this is um, sort of shifted what you do in class then? And I mean, are students becoming, uh, come in with greater understanding of what's going on? I, you know, the good news is we've set the bar pretty low. Students don't read the book anyway. <laughs> we accept that. Um, and so is that shifting that, and if that is happening, how does that shift what it is that you do with well, I'd say a number of us do reading quizzes before class to motivate people to read the book. Right. Because we, we you know, basically do conceptual questions in class quicker. Right. So this hasn't changed that. That's what we've always been doing. It. Right. You know, we thought as we started having enough videos that maybe we start asking questions about some videos and then like do the reading, you know, reading sections and watch the right. students' videos. I, I look at it as it's the kind of things I used to do in class. Some students still very want to see that. So how does this shift then what you do in the class? You freed up this time or do you do the well, same thing I'd in already, class now? No, I'd already freed up that time years ago. I just okay. stopped doing those. But students still wanted to see them. And that's part of the motivation. They would be playing while you're not doing Right, I get I why aren't you doing more derivations in class? I get that right now. So I'm wondering what how are you I, you know, the real difference between engineering and arts and sciences is you have a certification exam that that makes the curriculum, to me it seems like more relevant, right? You're doing, in theory, the student would realize that they would have to pass this exam to get the, I don't know whether that affects it or not. No. You don't think so? You don't no. see a, a... I mean, that, that exam, they only really have to take if they want to be a professional engineer. Well, what's the percentage of people in the College of Engineering who do not want to be professional engineers? 80%. And really? Yeah, it's mainly civil engineers that, like chemical engineers, not very often actually, because, like for civil engineering, you know. It's, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. That's a very, that is very good. You know, people that build bridges. It has to be a professional engineer that signs off that this. Oh, okay. So that's, a, that's only 20% of your students. That's a guess. I mean, you know. It's really mostly consulting engineers and civil engineers. So a few of our students end up being professional engineers, but that's very much a minority. I didn't mention it here, but some of the classes also have crossovers with other disciplines. I mean, like our fluids class, the videos are being watched, hopefully also by mechanical engineers, other students taking that class in other disciplines. So, so right now you guys are not designing these videos, you're just letting people, you're telling them they're available, let people just know where to see them. Yep. Um, has anybody, do you know if anybody is actually trying to integrate the message 
whether they are required to the course. And so I would think that would potentially allow you to shift the emphasis because you require those things to be required. I mean, we haven't done that ourselves yet. We haven't gotten into that. I think we have to get to the point we have a critical mass of before considering those yeah. Yeah. There is um, a TED video from um, the Khan Academy, the gentleman that you talked about earlier, where they have um, a few fifth and seventh grade classrooms, I think it's in California, like districts that are starting to use the Khan Academy website for doing math. And so they're talking, uh, in this video they go into brief descriptions of how the classroom is changing because of that, and how it's becoming more humanitarian, that we're actually sitting down and working with the students. Um, and their site, yeah, and this might, I mean, maybe there could be a good connection with them as well, because one of the things that they talk about that they, that I think they've done very well is the creator of Khan Academy comes from kind of an analytical background. So he is actually, the site has been created that you can kind of um, really dive deep down into the analytics of which problems are the students looking at, which problems are they having difficulty with, which videos are they watching, which ones aren't they. It's almost it's, overkill. It is almost overkill, but... Um, it really lets you get that fine detail. So in theory, you can sit down with Johnny and say, let's work on this problem without having to say, Johnny, what are you having problems with? Because you already know. Because you already know. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, in real time, too. Exactly. So, I mean, and, and he talks about it, of course, as being the future of education and that we're switching the lectures to outside of, he calls them, these essentially the lectures, that we're switching them to outside the classroom. We're spending this time to really work with the students and interact and be hands-on inside the classroom. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good time. Look it up. Yeah. Any more questions, or are we just blown away by how great that was? So, what, what, what are next steps? I mean, you want to make more videos um, on this. Have you thought about how to go deeper into assessment, either how they're used or how they're impacting uh, student understanding or engagement in the class or? Um, I, have you written a thirty million dollar center grant to get behind this? Support the rest of us for making videos for you. <laughs> you could oh, write that grant, that Noah. Have, we haven't figured how to do that. I'm not good enough, you know, just trying to get right enough of them right. available. But yeah, it'd be nice to actually show. You know, on one hand, I look and say, well, the fact that students watch them on their own means they're putting more time in the class than they would previously. That's got to be a good thing. Uh, but uh, it's a much bigger effort, I think, than to a kind of assessment. Right. We're probably not qualified. Well, it would be an interesting sort of session, uh, if, if this sort of text is on, to think about. There are a bunch of different, I mean, what pops into mind, for me, a bunch of different areas to look at. You could imagine. Um, looking at differential impact for students who do and don't, looking at different topic areas where students engage and don't, um, figuring out um, different modes by which you then can engage with students in the classroom versus not. I mean, there are all kinds of different levels, I think, uh, for which this is really susceptible for a sort of nice... I, I'm wondering whether there's a model where you could be doing it in, you know, so you stop doing the derivations in class, but people who haven't done that, you could imagine setting it up so that when people ask you questions, you do the derivation. Capture it so that you have it, you know, edit it down for just that. So to sort of build what you need as opposed to what you think you need. You know, so whenever somebody asks a question, if you had it set up in a way that you could you could automate, you know, sort of you were doing it and capturing it, that might be a very interesting way. But we don't have smart boards. Right? That, so, was, well, that was kind of our push with the hearing we got from the engineering center to do the smart board was that we envisioned that if you held office hours in there and students came in, you could answer the question by writing on the board, it's capturing it, and then you edit it. And put it on the well, you could board. capture the whole class with Camtasia if you're using a tablet. I mean, I use a tablet in class and I don't use a board, so you could capture it and, right. and then edit, take out, here's a chunk of that. that. That would be pretty simple to do. you got to be pretty careful with Camtasia and long video, though. Like, it really starts it freaking out. Does it? Uh, I'm sorry. Camtasia? Don't try to make a one-hour video with Camtasia yeah. unless you have a really awesome computer. <laughs> uh, in my experience. It does, it, he's right. It, after like 20, 30 minutes, it can start getting jumpy. Well, let alone, I mean, the, the, the response to you, Mike, I think that's really good to identify what it is that's needed rather than what it is that we project is needed. Flip side is we can do a better job 
um, retrospectively? Well, with sort of reflection, with thought and analysis, or after giving an in-person address, yeah, yeah, yeah. then the improvisational work that most of us do. Um, in I could even see LAs flagging things that should be done, you know, sort of if you're doing in-class tutorials, you know, they're going around saying, well, wouldn't it, be, it would be really nice to have the following for explanation, extended explanation. Or, and, yeah. well, I mean, let me play on this is what I thought of when I first, you know, was thinking about this was, what a great assignment. Part of a new tradition, you get the official best presentation of the day award. We don't, we don't want to be uh, <laughs> running this all the same place. place. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you.